everybody. How's it going? I am your host, Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC3 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator has been on a slight hiatus, but uh, we are back. It's just really difficult to do uh, a, a multiple shows over a summer break and, um, you know, with going on vacation and kids and family visiting and all that good stuff. And I've taken this as an opportunity to also do some retooling. Uh, so if you are watching this, um, you're, you may want to visit us on the web and get the latest version of the RSS links. The, um, the RSS feeds should auto-update. And for those clients that you know will auto-update their, or auto-redirect, and for those clients that auto-update their feeds... Um, they, you should start getting a, uh, you know, sh should start to automatically just going to the new feed. I have the new RSS subscription links posted in the show notes for this episode. So please do go, uh, get those. If you have a client that does not support, um, automatically uh, going to a, a new subscription link. And with that, um, let's go ahead and get right into it. Starting off at, uh, Actually, there we go. S starting off at CapitalOTC.com, uh, there's been some rumors floating around. There's a new Apple iPad or a new Apple event uh, this week. Um, there's supposedly an Apple Gold iPad Air 2. Uh, it will feature a Touch ID sensor and a more powerful processor. This is all kind of stuff that, that uh, I would expect to see at an Apple event. Um, however, there's uh, over at CNET a new um, or a story. Boy, I'm really out of practice for uh, the Geekinator. Um, over at CNET, there's a story um, about what we can expect. It's more feature rich story about what we can expect for the Apple event on October 16th. Um, you can expect to see new iPads. Uh, possibly a refreshed line, uh, a Mac line, and more about OS X Yosemite. So it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, what exactly they talk about. It's not going to be as, as big of an event as the iPhone event that they just had about a month or so ago. This will actually be at Apple's campus uh, in Cupertino. So uh, should be pretty interesting. Um, I'll be keeping an eye out and we'll obviously report on this uh, as we get along. Um, let's see here. Over at the Daily Mail, there's a story about uh, the FBI director here in the United States. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is basically the federal version of uh, police. And... Um, he, the, the director of the FBI, is warning that Apple's new privacy features put criminals beyond the law. I read the story because I was like, what? And really, it's my takeaway on this is it's basically a director that, that doesn't fully understand how security and privacy really works. Uh, is basically just spouting off because it makes it more difficult for his employees, his agents, to do their job. So, um, you know, understandable. However, if we wanted to make it easy for the FBI to do its job, we would all just go to jail and live in jail and the FBI wouldn't have anything to do. That's how easy their job would be. So, you know, I would rather have privacy and security. I mean, a lot of the stuff he talks about, uh, the messaging, the encryption, the new encryption standards for Apple's messaging. And, you know, the reality of the matter is, you know, Apple is implementing some really basic privacy features. Yeah, it's encrypted. Big deal. Get over it. It should have been encrypted from the very beginning. And in fact, there, lots of communication isn't encrypted now. Um, Apple isn't the only one doing this. Google does this. Uh, your connection between, you, mo at least for most uh, e email services, your connection between your email client and the email server is encrypted. A lot of email servers keep their files encrypted or at least keep them 
uh, more secure than being able to just get the stuff, you know, ad hoc. So, you know, I, when I see stuff like this, I, I just wonder, you know, does this guy really understand how this stuff really works? It, or is he just frustrated and spouting off, oh, the world's come to an end. It's more difficult for us to do our job. Well, yeah, but you can still get that data. You can get a court order to compelling somebody to hand their iPhone over to the federal authorities. If you really want that data, you can do that. And then, and you can compel them to unlock it. Uh, so, you know, it's just one of those. Anyway, like I said, doesn't really fully understand how it works and is spouting off because they can't do it the way they used to do it, is what it basically boils down to. From sciencerecorder.com, the military's secretive X-37B space plane is returning to Earth after a two-year mission. The U.S. Air Force's X-37B robotic space plane will be returning to Earth after spending 22 months in space on a secret mission. The exact landing date and time will depend on technical and weather considerations, the Air Force said in a statement. Uh, the space plane looks just like a miniature space shuttle. It's been sent into orbit three times um, and will return to Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. I'm curious what it's doing up there. It's probably taking a lot of photos, uh, you know, and is essentially doing what the uh, SR-71 used to do. Basically, it's a spy plane, and it just gives them a lot more maneuverability to get orbital photos instead of being like a satellite. So I'm guessing that's what it's for, but who knows? Uh, you know, it's one of those things that that uh, you know we'll probably never find out because it's classified, and you know, it's just I would love to know though. That would be pretty cool. From Yahoo Tech, what is Tesla's Model D, and why is everyone talking about it? They show some pictures here of the Model D. I actually had not really heard about the Model D until this evening when I was looking for stories. And apparently, uh, the Model D is just like the Model S because I saw pictures and was like, that looks just like the Model S. What's the difference? So, uh, what it is, is basically a Model S with two motors. One in the rear and one in the front. So, it's all-wheel drive. And it also comes with a new feature called autopilot. So the auto, what what the Model D's autopilot, it's not, at least from what I've read from the story, it's not fully enabled right now, but what it will ultimately be able to do is exactly what it sounds like, is it will detect the lane markings, it'll keep the car in the lane, it will detect... Uh, speed limit signs and drive at the speed limit of the last speed limit sign that it saw. It will uh, uh, detect other cars around it and avoid colliding with them. It will also do lane changes if it comes up on a car that happens to be driving significantly slower or you know some percentage slower than what the speed limit is. Um, you know it'll probably have some intelligence to say well the last speed limit sign i saw was 55 but you know every car i've passed is doing 50 maybe i missed a speed limit sign maybe i should just slow down to 50 and drive at the same speed as the rest of traffic so should be pretty interesting um i'm curious you know to, to that that actually has me more excited than than having a Model S with two motors. You know, the, the autopilot feature is something I've wished cars have had for a long time. There's no reason why they can't. So it'll be pretty interesting to see, um, you know, what kind of headway uh, Tesla makes with that, but uh, pretty cool. From computerworld.com, Google launches telemedicine beta for video chats with doctors. This is kind of neat. Uh, this is one of those things, that, you know, where I'd love to be able to have a chat with my doctor without having to actually go to the office. You know, I mean, the vast majority of things, uh, you know, or at least to have a triage chat with him, the vast majority of things can be taken care of, um, you know, without 
the doctor act, you know, actually physically going to the doctor, it would allow the doctor to see way more patients. Um, you know, I mean, it would just it'd be more efficient uh, because right now, you know, the way it is, if I, you know, am feeling kind of bad or whatever, I have to go to the doctor's office, sit there in the waiting room, you know, go through the whole process. Whereas it'd be great if I could just call the doctor's office and say, hey, can I have an appointment to talk to the doctor? They go, sure, no problem. Here's your time slot. You know, that time slot comes up. If I happen to be at work or I'm at home, doctor just takes the call. He can see me. He can hear me. He goes, whoa, you don't sound so good. You know what? I know what that is. Blah, 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 blah. Just from seeing electronically, you know, submits a prescription to my pharmacy and I go pick it up. You know, and I can, the whole thing can be done in, you know, 20, 30 minutes tops. Um, huge time saver. So anyway, should be pretty cool. It's it's a temporary trial. It's a new feature uh, for people looking for medical advice to connect with a physician for an online consult is, is basically what it is. A lot of stuff can be triaged that way. And you can essentially, you know clear a lot of the stuff that doesn't really require an office visit right off the plate and that way the doctors only has office visits for more serious ailments and ailments where he actually does physically need to see you and there are instances where that is the case you know like I happen to have high cholesterol as an example and you know I have to go to the doctor's office and get blood drawn they run tests the doctor needs to look at it now I could do that remotely but it's a lot easier to have a conversation with the doctor and talk about diet and, and have the doctor actually do a physical checkup on me while I'm there getting tested already for something else. So, you know, there are instances where it, it's beneficial for the doctor to, to actually physically see you, but um, that would clear off a lot of stuff. Like, you know, I just, I, I, it would clear off a lot of stuff. Okay, so from uh, ZDNet, this is the last story of this evening. From ZDNet, Dropbox blames other services for claimed 7 million password hack. So apparently this has happened. An unnamed hacker group is claiming that it has accessed uh, nearly 7 million Dropbox accounts. And when paid enough in Bitcoin, the group intends to publish more than the 1,200 usernames and passwords that it has Released after publication, Dropbox issued a statement saying that it had not been hacked. The usernames and passwords are fortunately stolen from other services and used in attempts to log into Dropbox accounts, the company is saying. We'd previously detected these attacks and the vast majority of the passwords posted have been expired for some time now. All other remaining passwords have been expired as well. For what it is worth, some Reddit users have said that the login credentials work, while others report that Dropbox is expiring the passwords on the affected accounts. So the reality of the matter is, you know, it sounds like that they gained access to a lot of accounts and 7 million, nearly 7 million accounts is a lot of accounts, but it's a drop in the bucket. Dropbox has over 220 million users. Um, so they've only got access to about 3% of the Dropbox database at best. And, you know, Dropbox, obviously, according to the statement they've said, is, have been aware of it for some time and are proactively taking measures uh, to mitigate it. So interesting, but at the same time, you know, not surprising. That will do it for this edition of The Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you haven't already done so. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. See you then. Bye.